and Deb organizers, thanks so much for having me. Um, I will try to catch us up. So disclosures are only speaking bureaus, but I do have to keep it up here for just a second. And I'll let you know that we're going to get ready to jump into the perioperative phase instead of just the postoperative phase as I go through this. And I really saw my assignment to be somewhat defining the skeleton onto which we can put all the other pieces through the rest of the sessions today. Um, postoperative pain, we know it's a problem. I've got some data here that's been repeated since this uh, initial survey and outpatient follow-up for operations. We don't do a great job managing it, though we do a very good job causing it. So we need to think about this issue. This is really our goal. I can refer to this throughout most of the talks that I saw listed coming up for today. We want to optimize our pain management, and we want to, at the same time, have a very effective, um, thank you, a very effective functional recovery. And we know that a lot of the drugs that we use to manage pain don't allow for both of those things to happen in the gears that we hope to see it here. Uh, you've already seen this one. We start our pain management often with opioids. If that doesn't work, we give a little more opioid. If that doesn't work, we give the patient control of more opioid. And then we start getting tricky with some other things. And what we'd like to actually look at is flipping that around. How about if we all learn, as surgeons, the other things that can be used and then only use the opioid should we get to the point of needing something for a rescue? How do we do that? Why do we, how do we go forward and help our patients with pain while causing the fewest side effects or putting them at the least risk? Well, we need to recognize that most pain is multifactorial. Again, we'll touch on some anxiety and depression components of pain management. But really, you can't think about pain management as being one drug because there's no one thing that will take care of it. When we talk about multimodal analgesia, I'll have on the slides MMA, this is really defined as the combination of two or more things that act in different ways. The main goal is to try and decrease the adverse effects that are possible with opioids, not necessarily to get rid of them, and not necessarily to make a patient pain-free, but it's to decrease those adverse effects. You're doing an okay job if you do something that's additive. You're doing a great job if you do something that's synergistic. And several of the things we can talk about around the time of surgery are that. How do we figure those out? you got to figure out what postoperative pain is. These are all the places that postoperative pain come from. Um, it comes from our knife. It comes from visceral pain. And it also can be exaggerated, again, by patient factors. It's kind of tricky. Um, I don't know of anybody in the audience who probably does surgery without an anesthesiologist, though. So to keep us caught up, I'll say there are lots of references, and you have one above the curtain every day when you're in the operating room. All of these things are defined as pain pathways that we have agents for. So when we look at it, what can we potentially use? We want to look at the pathways. We want to talk about what we will use relative to the source of the pain. And then we want to give two or more drugs with different profiles so that we can address peripheral and central um, sensitization. We also want to choose at least additive, if not synergistic drugs. And we want to consider treating along the pathway where a patient will have pain um, uh, drive going. Here's another example of the different targets that we can talk about. So we're causing pain. We want to figure out how that pain travels through the patient and where we can potentially hit it at several different points. Again, great reference. Take a picture if you want. But again, you've got somebody who knows this with you every day in the operating room. Just a, a side point, counter-distinction, preemptive analgesia is not the same as MMA, though it should always be part of MMA. Preemptive is before we do anything. So when you're in the post-operative setting, you're not talking about, oh, I'm going to give you this preemptive medication. It actually is a, a different term. And when you go to search it to try and learn more about this, please be sensitive to the two different terms. So specifically, my assignment was, how do we manage multimodal analgesia? How can you create an MMA plan within your enhanced recovery work? And really, you need to step back and think about the principles of enhanced recovery again. The greatest impacts of enhanced recovery, regardless of what piece of it you're talking about, are recognized when you have successful continuity ac across all of the phases of care. So you can't say this is the anesthesiologist's job. You can't say it's how my post-operative resident does it. You can't say it's how my clinic nurse refills the opioids. This is something that goes from the very beginning to the very end.
It requires consideration of the surgical stress. You've got to talk to people with, about what you're going to be doing to them as patients. Talk to your anesthesiologist about the, the stress that you'll be causing. Preoperative planning is essential. Education of the patient, telling them surgery hurts, is really something that we need to say and not avoid. Teamwork from surgery clinic in the pre-op setting, the anesthesia pre-op clinic, the preoperative holding, and then carrying that through to the ward is also important, and I'll go through some details on that. And then evidence for the patient-targeted interventions that apply. You have to be careful. Not every medicine applies to every patient. But the idea of every medicine that we can use in MMA is important to consider in every operation you do. Um, this is just following through the phases of care very generally. What do we want to do? We want to look preoperatively. We want to define for our colleagues who will help us take care of the patient's pain, particularly if we're defining some preemptive analgesia we want to use as part of our MMA. What's the surgery going to be like? You know, my doing a lap proctocolectomy pouch is a four to eight hour operation. It's pretty significantly stressful to that patient who is often coming in already sick. But when I finish, the holes on the outside might look just like a lap coli that would only take someone an hour or 90 minutes. We have to have the conversation. This is not just how things look on the outside, but also what we're doing to the patient and how they're coming to us. Interoperatively, I'll leave that for one of the talks later today, but you have to have a constant conversation. If something changes in your surgical planning, I want to do an ultra-low LAR, but I end up doing an APR, there's going to be a wound outside of my epidural zone. There's going to be a wound that we were not anticipating, and I need to reach over the curtain and go, hey, I've done something here that's going to cause this patient more pain. I'm changing the surgical stress and have that conversation to make sure it carries through. Same with the PACU. Most, most of the recovery rooms in the U.S. are taken care of by the anesthesiologist or co-managed, and then folks go out to the ward under the surgeon's care. It's a very important transition and a time when patients get a lot more opioid than we're actually aware of. And then, of course, on discharge, we've already been talking about. I'm going to fly through a couple of slides with some details on that. Um, the surgery clinic expectations we already talked about are preoperative holding drugs. So the patient comes to surgery five days, five weeks, five months after we see them in the surgery clinic. When we post a case to the operating room at Duke, we actually have a preoperative order set that includes our meds that we want that patient to get in pre-op holding. Having that continuity of discussion does not take it out of the hands of the anesthesiologist for that day, but it certainly lets them know what we're thinking about. And those are actual drugs that can be bedside and ready to be given as soon as the whole team checks in preoperatively. Our anesthesia clinic can see that order set, can see what I've written for that patient, and can reinforce the plan of this is what we're doing. We're going to hurt you. This is how we will take care of your pain, and this is what we want to have happen. And then preoperative holding obviously has this before any of the team members get bedside, such that the first conversation with the patient can include, we're going to give you some medications here today before we start getting you ready for surgery, and this is why. Uh, an example of what we use, we use gabapentin in the pre-op holding area. We use acetaminophen unless we plan to use IV acetaminophen at fascial closure. And we use NSAIDs when appropriate, not always in all of our patients, but um, we certainly try to get them in. Interoperatively, again, I'm going to defer that to my colleague who will talk about that. Um, but most importantly, please talk to your team members. And then when you get out to the ward, again, think very much about the PACU transition. Part of our transition needs to be nurse-to-nurse -nurse communication about what was done for analgesia. How much drug did they get? Are they hurting now? And you're getting ready to send them out to me. Thanks so much for giving them some Dilaudid on the way. But what am I going to do when that wears off and is that in place? Very important detail of the transition. And then again, what do we need? Am I going to need to get into some of those fancy things that perhaps my surgery intern won't be able to prescribe, like IV lidocaine or ketamine? Think about that in the PACU so that you're ready when you get to the post-op ward. And then immediately at the post-op ward, the job is not just, oh, hey, let me check you into the post-op ward. It's, hey, let me check you into your discharge center because you're only here to get ready for discharge. What did your doctor talk to you about when you were in the pre-op clinic? How, what is the plan that you're expecting? Do you know the names of your drugs? And your nurses need to be empowered to have that kind of conversation. If you've used any sort of block, be ready for it to wear off. Be ready to get it out. And if you're going to have a conversation, make sure that the conversation with your anesthesia colleagues is not, I want fantastic pain control. It's, I want fantastic pain control and I want to get the patient out of the hospital. They can do a great job with pain management. 
but your patient's gonna be connected to three or four things, right? So you need to have the constant conversation, no, let's transition off of this, they're ready for orals, or they need to start their home regimen. And the post-operative ward already discussed in the discharge plan, stick to it. Whatever you define in the pre-op clinic, don't back down, don't feel like you had to have to give more opioid than you were planning unless something changed along the post-operative course. And again, communicate to your outpatient team to close the loop back around so everybody's in, in continuity there. This is part of one of our Acer and Pokey um, publications, and we certainly go on to discuss the details, and I would refer you to the publication for that. And then lastly, this is a, a nice infographic where we talk about the timeline of each of the details relative to enhanced recovery and MMA, what to give when, what to think about, and how the drugs can be impactful. Always have a rescue plan. Often it will be opioids. Again, it's to take care of the patient, but think about it as we need to make sure there's an assessment and a decision about what you want to use. But go back to this, and this is something that I wouldn't mind if you wanted to laminate and put on your ward because it doesn't change that much. The drug names might, but the idea doesn't. And if you need to know a little bit more, please join us at ACER a little bit later in the month. Thanks. Thank you.